How would your professor write a literature review? How would they create a beautiful figure like this one? Well, I can tell you because I used to be an academic. I used to grade students' essays at postgraduate, undergraduate level, with literature reviews. And then I left academia and I became a professional writer. So now this is what I do for a living. And during the last year, I also opened this channel where I review AI platforms to help you read, write, find research papers with AI and so on. So I spent all in all a lot of time crafting, writing documents. And then I learned about different AI platforms to help you make it easier, smoother and faster. So the purpose of the video today is to tell you everything I know really. So we'll talk about the purpose of a literature review. We'll talk about how we can write it from scratch so that you get a first class mark. And finally, which AI you can use that is free and that will definitely help you make this process faster and easier. So the purpose of a literature review is to summarize and analyze all of the literature to find research gaps, to find patterns, trends, and suggest any future experiments. So essentially, it's like building a pyramid. You start very, very broad with all of the literature, with all of the papers, and then you slowly summarize them until you get to the tip. And at that step, you have the research gaps, the trends, the patterns, the future implications. And to be able to do this, you actually need to spend only one or two sentences per paper on average so that you can summarize all of them and you can arrive at that conclusion. And this is what I, a reviewer and examiner, is looking for. And also for a few other things as well. So we'll go through all of this, but the first thing is, You've probably just got a title and you know what you're supposed to write about. And what I would suggest to you, what I would do, is I would actually jump to ChatGPT to create an outline for my literature review. So this is what I've done here and ChatGPT created an outline for me about ALUPS because this is my field of expertise. I'm a molecular biologist. And to be honest, there's a lot of information here and it's quite complex and it's very much at the PhD level. So if you are not a PhD student, then you would need to ask ChatGPT to tailor this to the level you're at, bachelor's, master's, high school, whatever it is. However, if maybe you want to go a little bit more complex than this, then I would suggest to jump to perplexity because that actually gave me even a more complex answer. And what is really nice here is that I also have quite a few references some of them are good, some of them are not, but it's worth considering them. Either way, now you have these two outlines and you roughly know what you need to talk about and in what order. And that's really, really important and gives you some idea of what you're going to read about and what you should read about as well. So let's find these papers. Let's populate your library. So first of all, you need something like Google Scholar, which is a generic library with loads and loads of papers. And this is the first library you need to use. The second library you should use should be specific to your field of study. So for example, Eric is great if you are in education. JS Tor is great if you're in history. And then finally, PubMed is great for me, is great for anyone with biomedical sciences. So this is what I'm going to stick to because this is what I know the best. So. This is the topic for my uh, literature review here, how are loops cause diseases, right? And I've got 276 hits, which is a great start, to be honest. And you may get more, you can get less. So what is really important is to identify the keywords. So R loops could be a keyword, but I bet if I just search for R loops, I will get over a thousand papers. So it's not the most useful keyword because it's a little bit vague. Diseases is even worse because diseases will give me, you know, tens of thousands of hits. But maybe all of diseases is the right keyword to start with. Well, maybe it wasn't because I've got 300 hits now, but this is what we have and let's try to work with this. So first of all, you need to set up inclusion exclusion criteria to find the right papers. So for a literature review, this needs to be up to date. So you should be only looking to start for the most recent papers. So 
Let's look for last five years. So this is the first exclusion criteria. We're only looking for the newest papers from the last five years. Then we only want to read reviews or systematic reviews. So I'm going to select systematic reviews now. And now we have 50 papers, which is brilliant, which is a really, really good number. And what you really need to pay attention to is when, when the paper was published and also which journal was it published in. Because if you pick a paper that is, for example, two years old, then you'll be missing the last two years of research. And you will have to find these papers on your own. And it might be a little bit difficult, a little bit time consuming. So this first paper is actually great because it's from April 2024. So it's half a year old. This is actually pretty good. And I would say you need to pick maybe four or five reviews, recent reviews to read, to get your head around the topic, to understand what people are talking about, what do we know, what we don't know, and so on. How do you pick these five recent papers? It's also by looking at the impact factor of each journal. So this is molecular cancer. So you need to look for impact factor. So this is molecular cancer impact factor, which is 37.3. And this is actually great. This is really high. Anything above 10, I would definitely recommend. These are reliable papers. So this is how we can find papers by reading, by reading literature reviews and then looking at the source papers, right? Because what you need to cite in your literature review are not other reviews. You need to source, you need to cite original research papers. And that's really, really important for me as a reviewer. This will show me that you've actually done a literature review rather than just read a couple of reviews. So you definitely need to look at the papers that are cited. But if you do want to use AI to help yourself with this, you could definitely use ResearchRabbit, which will create this beautiful map for you here, this web, all of the papers, how they are connected, and you can easily explore and find more. And if you want to learn a little bit more about research paper, I've done a video on this, so you can find it up here. And well, once you have lots and lots of papers, then you will definitely, and you're reading them, you will definitely need to have a way to organize them. And this is where Mendeley and Zotero come because they are free reference managers. They are quite similar. I made a video um, where I compared them to each other. All in all, I would say Zotero is a little bit better if you want to use AI because you can plug Zotero into different AI platforms. It's a little bit better than Mendeley in terms of this. And to be honest, at the moment, it's my preference as well, just because of aesthetics. I find it a little bit easier to use. Um, I'm not getting any money for this from Zotero or Mendeley, but just letting you know what, what is my preference. Um, what is really important here as you're gathering these papers, as you're reading them, is that you start categorizing them, first of all. So I'm talking about ALUPs and diseases. So I will have lots of different diseases, and it would be really good to categorize my papers by the diseases. So essentially categorize them them thematically. You could do it chronologically, depending on your topic. Here, I would do it thematically. So I create these folders to separate these papers so I know what belongs to what. And then in each paper, I highlight, I create two bullet points for each paper. Why? Because when it comes to writing the literature review, this is all I will need, just a couple of bullet points, maybe a couple of sentences to summarize each paper. And I know this sounds quite harsh, but honestly, I could summarize my own research in two, three words, two, sorry, two, three sentences, you know? So it is what it is, and this is how you actually are able to summarize the whole literature. So you, you do this, and as you read these papers, I'm sure you will have some questions about them, right? So I would explain, I would suggest to you explain paper. I think this is a great tool. So the way it works is that you highlight text in a paper that you don't understand. And then you simply just click explain. But you can also customize explanation to the level. So graduate, postgraduate, and so on. And you click explain. And you have unlimited number of these. So you can really ask explain paper as many questions as you want. Size space is pretty good as well, but it will give you a high, very high level overview of lots of papers at once. That's essentially how it works, which is useful. But to be honest, all of these 
overviews here are quite vague, are very vague, I would even say. So I personally don't find them that useful. But if you want to have a very quick overview of 10 papers at once, then this is the way to do it. If you want to get a summary, which is a little bit more in depth of a paper, I would suggest I would use Avidnote. Um, so all you need to do is just to write, to write, summarize this paper in however many words you want. I picked 200 words. Now, it does the job very, very well, and I picked 200 words because on a free plan with Avidnote, you get 5,000 words a month. So if you stick to this number, you'll be able to summarize 25 papers in bit more depth, which is really useful. Now, also, the top tip when you're reading these papers, don't read everything. I don't know a single academic who would read a whole paper ever because there's simply no time. You just need to be selective. Maybe you will only read the abstract, the introduction, maybe, maybe you know, a part of the results section. Whatever it is, you need to know that this is the only relevant section for you to read. Otherwise, you will just waste your time. Because when later when you write, all I want from you is, is sentences that are on the topic. I don't want to see anything off topic and you will lose mark from, from the examiner if you go off topic. So it's really, really important when you only read what is relevant because this is only the stuff you'll be talking about later in your literature review. And finally, now we're getting to the writing part. And the very first step with writing is the table of contents. And I want you to pause here and think really, really hard about this because this is not easy and it's absolutely crucial. Of course, you could potentially recycle the table of contents you've got from ChatGPT, from Perplexity, maybe you've seen it in one of the review papers you've read. That's absolutely fine. And clearly, this is what people tend to use, so it's well established and no one will but an eye. But if you maybe want to do something else, organize it differently, then that's also okay, but you will have to justify it. And maybe you're doing this to, you know, to point out a new research gap, point out a new trend, whatever it is, you will have to justify it. But as you write, what we are looking for as examiners is the flow and relevancy. So you need to stay relevant. So I would always suggest to have the title of your literature review in the header as you're drafting. Just right there on top, you can see it all the time and you will never forget and you will never go off topic. And then the second point is that you, you maintain logical flow and this is why the table of contents is so important. When you think about it, you make sure that from one section to another, from one paragraph to the next, everything flows in a logical manner. Because if it doesn't, you will confuse the reader. They will be like, why are we talking about this, this now? This, these two things are not connected, I don't understand. And this is how you will lose points. So it's really, really important that you pause, you get it right in a, in a nice logical order, and then it'll be just a matter of populating all of these points in your table of contents, because you already have bullet points in your Zotero that you created when you were reading the papers. So it's basically just copying and pasting them and then connecting these sentences. Now, what is really important here is how you connect them. And you will probably have to use these, you know, words like moreover, nevertheless, however, and so on. So if you are not a native English speaker like me, I would 100% recommend using OSDIC. This is a dictionary. This is not an AI tool, but it is a collocation dictionary. So what it is all about is um, about making the non-native English speakers sound more like native speakers. And what it will help you with is all the word combinations. So which words go with, you know, with other words and then um, what would be the best context for the words you're using and so on. So it will just make it all sound and flow more natural. And to be honest, I'm sure there are a lot of students that lose a lot of points because they just don't know how to express themselves in a clear and logical manner. They actually know everything, but, they, but, but the language barrier is a real problem. And OSDI can really help with this. And then the next thing, you might want to create some figures. So I would say go to bioicons.com 
because all of these icons here, you can copy paste them for free into PowerPoint, into Word, and there's literally hundreds of them. Some of them are biology, some of them are chemistry, there is some machine learning, IT, so there is a little bit here to play with. Or you can use them to create beautiful figures like this one, beautiful sketches. And once you have your draft, what you need to do is that you need to give it to someone who is not an expert in your field and then ask them to summarize your literature review. Why? Because this is how you will learn what they truly understood. And if they truly understood something, that means you've written this well in a clear and logical manner. You used short sentences, you used accessible language, you used subheadings. It just all made sense to them, even though they're not an expert in your field. And that's really important. And then there will be probably sections where they will be like, um, I don't really know what this is about. I didn't, I didn't really get it. And this is a cue for you, but you need to go back to this section, rewrite it to make it more accessible, easier, more logical, and then give it back to them and work with them until they fully understand everything you've written. And in this way, you will truly, truly improve your literature review and ensure that you get a first class mark. And if you need any more coaching about this, feel free to reach out to me and I will be happy to offer some free coaching as well. Thank you.